How you doing? I feel like home. I've been here a few times. I think we were here two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's a joy to be here. And so what I want to do is I just want to spend a few minutes giving you a report. Uh, I always feel like when I come back, I feel like I'm kind of one of these kind of guys. I like Knights of the Round Table, all that kind of stuff. So I always feel like when I come back, I'm like this uh, guy who sits down with your pastor and we, we sit at this round table and we throw all our weapons on the table, you know, we take a keg uh, and, and, you know, and then we talk about the wars that we were able to win for our king. Yes. That's what I love talking about the wars we were able to win for our king. And, and, I, and I can tell you that where we are right now, it is, yeah, it's hopping. We're having a lot of fun. We just baptized three people yesterday. I wasn't even there. I had someone else baptized. One guy from Pakistan, uh, another a, a woman from Indonesia, and another woman from, uh, from Australia. We're having people from all around the world come to where we live. And uh, we're seeing people come to Jesus uh, our, our goal is a baptism a week, and we are well over that this year. We have just seen so many people come to Jesus. I guess I'll tell you another story. Uh, like this one girl, ah, blah, blah, I'll tell you about Christian. Christian was this guy who didn't, didn't even believe in God, nothing. And uh, he, he, he just, he tried everything. It was kind of like the whole Solomon thing. He went out and just tried everything. He got involved in, and he made all kinds of money and it didn't satisfy him. He had all kinds of girlfriends that didn't satisfy him. He had all kinds of boyfriends that didn't satisfy him. He had all kinds of th stuff like this. He got into new age and, and that couldn't satisfy him. And so then he came to one of our gatherings. Something happened to him. And then he went on, he got so curious about, uh, uh, about God because he was like, I've tried everything else. I must as well just try God. And he went on uh, YouTube and, and he saw this, uh, all right, uh, I don't know about theological stuff. I'm just going to give you what happened, okay? And so he saw this, this guy and this guy was talking about how to pray a prayer of deliverance. And he was like, wow, that's wild. That's crazy stuff. And so he was in the gym and he was working out at my friend's gym, and he decided, you know what, I'm going to pray that prayer. And so he prayed a prayer of deliverance over himself, and he started manifesting demonic stuff coming out of him. He was getting sick. He had to go in the bathroom, all kinds of crazy stuff. He came back, and now he's on fire for Jesus. He's been baptized. He's just all over Jesus. He can't get enough of Jesus, and he's so powerful. He's, he's, because he's seen it happen with himself, now he's praying for other people and he's watching people get delivered. Oh, I, that doesn't happen in America. Don't worry about it. There's no demons here. You don't have to worry about a thing. You know, but where I am, that's kind of what they do. You know, they, they kind of visit witch doctors and they, they get involved in all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, yeah. So uh, the verse that I thought of when I wanted to give this report was uh, when... when um, uh, John the Baptist asked if Jesus was the one or should they wait for someone else? And Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you have heard and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are clean, are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are, uh, rise, are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And that is what we are seeing. We have seen blind eyes open, deaf ears hear, lame people walk, paralyzed people. We've seen demons be cast out. We've seen it all. It's fun. If I could say one thing, I learned. Am I? If I could say one thing I've learned uh, in my time in Indonesia is that God is so powerful. He is so powerful. You know, you don't have to convert people. All you have to do is introduce them to Jesus. You just have to introduce them to Jesus. Even, even I'm a testimony. It only happened like maybe last November. I went to this, uh, we had this uh, retreat. We did this retreat for people. And uh, it was all about uh, how to pray for people who are who have been, you know, uh, caught up in, 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 in demonic stuff and how to pray deliverance and things of that nature. Uh, and I happened to be there, and, and, and of course I was there uh, since I was doing it. Um, and, and, but there was another friend of mine, <clears throat> he, was, he was teaching, and he happened to mention, he was just like talking. And I, I, I don't know why he mentioned it, but he mentioned, uh, he told a story about dyslexia. And I was dyslexic. Uh, I've been dyslexic since I was in third grade. And um, I said, hey, why not? So I went up, I said, you know, I'm dyslexic, can you pray for me? 
And I'll tell you how wild it is. God has healed me from dyslexia. And what's really crazy is when I look, when I look at the, when I look at the words on the page, it, they, they look weird to me because they look, they, they're clear. It's like, that's weird. Like, because when you've been hanging out in something for a long time, if you've been buying onto a lie for a long time, when the truth comes, it looks strange. So it took me a while to like actually enjoy my healing because I'm like looking at the words going, that's weird. But I am healed. I am completely healed. I love to see the page nice and clear. It's amazing. God is good. And so we've seen all kinds of stuff happening there. Recently, so let me just give you a couple of other things and then we're going to get to the word because I got a word for you today. Um, so we, we have our community. We have like, now we have two campuses. We started one campus in a place called Kuta and uh, it is just multiplying like crazy. And then we recently just started a second campus uh, in a place because it was in the part of a city that it's hard to get to. And so they couldn't, Long story. Anyways, I said, since they can't come to us, we're going to go to them. And we opened up uh, a, a, a gathering on Sunday afternoon uh, at the end of maybe beginning of February, somewhere in there. And, you know, normally we're used to kind of like the, you know, 50 people, 75 people, 100 people. Well, there's no rooms big. The only biggest place we could find was a place that fits 130 people. And, and yesterday, which is today uh, in Indonesia, uh, there was, a, there was 240 people in a room that can only fit 130 people. There's so many people coming. They don't even know Jesus. They're coming. And we don't understand. They're standing in the back, sitting on the floor. They're just hungry for Jesus. The, Carol was, we were sitting there and, and we were worshiping this guy. And they're, they're all like new agers. Like all these people that are into like yoga and all stuff. They're all coming. They're all hungry for Jesus because there's a lot of people. That's what people, that's why they go. Because they're hungry. Don't tell me. Yeah. Don't tell me <laughs> that people are not hungry for God. I'm talking about America. They're hungry. That's why they chase after women. That's why they chase after alcohol. That's why they go after drugs. That's why they're getting involved. Because they're hungry. And so we got these people coming. And so like this one girl is, oh, yeah, watch out for that. that Carol is sitting next to Carol and, and she's like going at it. She's worshiping like crazy, you know? And I preach and I sit back down and she comes walking over. And she goes, you know, I channel Jesus. She goes, she's like new ager. She's I, I channel Jesus. I don't know anything about the Bible. Can I go to the Bible study? Of course you can. And so she's doing these healing rooms, like literal, uh, if you know anything about uh, New Age, Kundalini and Reiki, all this crazy stuff. They're talking to snakes. I mean, we're, the Kundalini people, they speak in tongues. It's not even tongues. It's tongues, but it's not tongues. Like we know it. I'm not kidding you, right? So she's like, she's all over the place, right? And like, I'm talking to her and she's saying, she, she, sa she says, oh yeah, I hear, I hear God. I said, really? You hear God? Are you sure? So I took off my, I have these, uh, these Oakley uh, knockoff glasses. They're knockoffs, you know, you can get every knockoff, everything. Really, really cheap. It's nice. Good stuff too. And I said, I have these Ray-Bans. I'll sell you these Ray-Bans. I'll sell them to you for 150 bucks, you know, $150 because they're used. They're $300 glasses. I'll say, she goes, I won't buy those. I said, why not? She goes, because they're knockoffs. I said, how do you know? The only way you know a knockoff is if you know the original. How do you know the voice of God unless you know the original? So we began. I said, listen, you know what? Next time you do your kundalini class, invite Jesus in. So she invites Jesus into this classroom. Like she's doing healings and stuff. Like they can do healings too, you know. And she invites Jesus in. All of a sudden, she goes, everything is different. It's so amazing. It's unbelievable what's happening here. And so she starts bringing Jesus into everything she's doing. We got a note the other day. She goes, I want out of all darkness. I only want Jesus. God is powerful. He's powerful. <clears throat> Don't try these things at home. So we, we're, we're seeing uh, all this stuff happen, and then we're, well, so we're doing this, and then we started uh, training people to do house churches up in the villages, because you can't build buildings, you can't do it that way, so we started training, and right now we have 30 house churches, our goal is to do 150 house churches next year, we, we, we're just seeing people, my friend, uh, she was my assistant, she used to be a Muslim, uh, and she came to Jesus a couple of years ago, 
to watch that. It's online. Um, so uh, she came and, and she, I, I hired her as my assistant because I'm so organized. I need someone to help me schedule. And um, that's a joke. Anyways, uh, so she, she, we started teaching on starting house churches. And the joke is I fired her. I fired her because she was leading so many people to Jesus. She started seven house churches. I said, you're no longer my assistant. I fire you. I'm hiring you to do that. And just recently, she was up in this one area, and she led this young man to Jesus, and her, her, his father was a, a, a Hindu priest. And his, his father tore up the Bible, threw it at his son, said, get out of my house, kicked her out. And uh, he said, don't worry, God will show you. Well, don't you know what happens, right? All of a sudden, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, he gets sick. The father gets sick. And so the son's home says, can I pray for you? Praise in the name of Jesus. He gets healed. Now he came to Jesus and all his followers have come to Jesus. So now she's busy up there. She's a little busy. So God is doing all kinds of works. We're having a lot of fun. Pray this September. We're, we're going to do this crazy family festival thing, football size field, three nights. Just pray we don't get arrested. Anyways, okay. Let's get into the word. Let's get into the word. I got a few minutes. I got enough time to really just kind of give you some good stuff. So uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to jump in. And I'm going to go really, really fast. I want to talk about the heart of the father. And in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around Jesus to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they murmured or they muttered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Actually, Jesus told them three parables. And those three parables to answer the, the thinking of the Pharisees. Now, who are the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees are the holders of the keys to the kingdom. You know that, right? That the Pharisees were the ones who were teaching people how to get to God. Now, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is that Jesus loves you. The bad news is that you're not always the hero of the story when you read. Who's the key holders to the kingdom of God now? We are. We are the ones who help people find the, the, the way to, the, to heaven. We help people find the way to Jesus, right? So we're the key holders. This is why we have to be careful here. Because here's how the Pharisees thought. When they looked at these sinners, right, they, they stood far off from the sinners. Why? Because they said, if we touch them, we will become unclean. If we, if we, you know, go with them, we hang out. You know, here's Jesus sitting among the sinners. You ever notice that Jesus, he doesn't get disturbed by people who don't know him. He doesn't get upset around them. Whereas the Pharisees, you know, they're the key holders. See, religious people, religious people are more concerned about themselves than they are of others. What will happen to me if I get touched this? What happened to me if I get involved in this? What happened to me if I hang out with them? What will happen to me, me, me? That's what the Pharisees were thinking. Yet Jesus is hanging out with them, right? You know? How do you respond to people who don't know Jesus? You know, how dare you act like that in my presence? How dare you use the Lord's name in vain in my presence, says the key holders. That's going to really bring him to the kingdom. So Jesus gives him three parables. First one, lost sheep. He says he leaves the 99. There's 100 sheep. One gets lost. He leaves the 99, and he goes after the one, or the shepherd goes after the one, right? And when he finds the one, he rejoices. Second parable, lost coin. It says a woman lost a coin, and it says she lights a lamp in her house, and she sweeps the floor until she finds the coin, and when she finds the coin, she rejoices. Third parable, the parable of the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. I don't really like that term, but for lack of better words, you know what that is. It's the son who, you know, takes all the money from the father. He squanders it all. He throws it all away. He wastes it all. And then he comes home. And when he comes home, what's the father do? He runs with all might. 
and wraps his robe around him and, and gives him a ring and celebrates and says, the one who is lost is now found. And if you'll notice that Jesus never says anything to the Pharisees until the end, the older son. The older son is all mad because the younger son came to Jesus, or came, to, sorry, you know, came to the father, came home. He says, well, look at all I've done. I've done everything. How come you don't do anything for me? See, religious people are worried about me. So I want to just share a few thoughts on this, this parable, these parables to kind of give you some understanding. First, if you're lost, if you feel like you're lost, if you feel like, you know, you just kind of wandered off, and now you don't know where you are, and you, you're just crying out, I want you to know Jesus is coming for you because he leaves the 99. He's coming after you. If you feel like you've been like just thrown away and you're in some dusty old corner and no one's seeing you, no one thinks about you, if you're that lost coin, I can tell you right now, Jesus is sweeping the floor looking for you. If you screwed your life all up and you've messed it all up and you, you feel like you don't deserve to be his son, you don't deserve to be part... He's, he wants you, man. He wants to put his robe around you. He's just waiting for you. All you have to do is turn one little bit to him, and he's going to run full speed towards you. So if you're lost today, know the heart of the Father is to come. It's to come. And when we get, when we get closer in this, and I'm going to go into detail in each one of these <clears throat> and show you what the heart of the Father is. And I hope that by the end of this, you will get the heart of the Father. When we were singing that song, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. I hope that's you now. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll tear down every wall. I hope that you'll climb every mountain, that you'll you, come in after them with all your might. I hope you'll never give up. Because that's the heart of the Father. That's the heart of the Father. Wow, you're out already. That's quick, man. I'm good. I told you five past, not two past. Like Anyways, <laughs> first one, you got the sheep, sheepfold, right? One gets lost. You know that, you, you know that the, the shepherd's coming, right? So the question is, is which one of those three are you? Are you the shepherd? Are you searching? Are you hungry? Are you like saying, I need to find the one that's lost? Do you remember? Are you the, the sheep that's just like enjoying green pastures? It's because the heart of the shepherd is to bring the sheep back into the sheepfold. So maybe someone has left Cornerstone. Maybe they were hurt by somebody. Maybe you, a thousand reasons why people don't, they, they stop coming to, to a, a, a community. Do you care about them? Or are you just enjoying the good messages, the great worship, the, the, the good Bible studies? You know? Oh, I'm enjoying green pastures. What do I really care if one of my friends, one of, one of the sheep that I knew before, what do I care if they're, they're not here? I'm enjoying Which one are you? <laughs> Anyways, just having some fun. <laughs> Second one. In, in the parable of the coin, there's a cultural thing that's possible. Uh, it's not necessarily true, but it's possible. Uh, and, and since it fits my message, I'm going to use it. <laughs> just, no, no good. Okay. In those days, uh, I'm going to read, I'm reading this commentary. In those days, women didn't wear rings as we do today. Instead, they had those, these elaborate headpieces that sometimes were adorned, adorned with 10 coins. And when they would go to the marketplace, they would put the, the, the crown upon them head and they would walk around and say, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm married. I'm married to a really great guy. He's rich. You know, he takes care of me. And so it's very possible when he's talking about this lost coin, he's talking about one of the coins that has fallen from the, the headpiece. And what does the woman do? She gets down on her knees and she's sweeping 
in the dirt looking for a coin. If that's what you've been doing, have you been like searching around? You don't care if you get dirty. You're hanging out with sinners. Why? Because there's a lost coin in there. Do you see, do you see people who don't follow Jesus as someone of great value? Enough value that you will sweep and keep looking until you find. And look what the lady does. She, when she finds the coin, she takes it and she puts it back to the place of prominence. You know, when you come to Jesus, it says he takes us out of darkness and he puts us in his marvelous light. He pulls us from the lowest place and he seats us in heavenly places. Is that what you do when someone comes to Jesus or do they have to work their way there? Do they have to earn their, their way to the top? It's not in Jesus. It's not what happens. He's going to take you and me, and he's going to, I always get this picture of, you know how you grab a cat sometimes by the back of the neck, and the cat's like this, you know. It doesn't hurt the cat, but he, I just have this, I always have this picture that Jesus is going to grab me by the neck, back of the neck, and I'm going to be like this. He's going, he's going to show all the powers and principalities of darkness. He's going to go, look, look at what I did through this guy. Look at my wonderfully made uh, being. He's a king. He's a saint. He doesn't put shame, and that's the last thing. Is the, 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 the father, after his son does all this stuff, right? After the, after the son does all this stuff, it says, it says he runs after them. Now, culturally, there's something that's, that's happening here that's very possible is what's happening because if someone in that town, they knew that the son had taken that and squandered all the money. Because he actually asked his father, he said, I wish you were dead because he wants his inheritance. And so the father's running because if someone in the town saw that son first, they would have ran out, they would have took a clay pot and they would have thrown it at his feet and they would have said, shame on you. And the father doesn't want any shame on his son. He doesn't want any shame on his son. When someone turns and starts walking back to God, do you like, shame on you. Look what you did. You should have never done that. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that to you? He puts a robe on him, puts a ring on him. He says, come on, let's celebrate. Let's rejoice. And what I love about this parable is it doesn't really have an ending, this parable of the, the son who returns. Because I get this picture in my mind. You never know if the older son enters the, you don't know if he goes in and finally celebrates. You don't know that. It's possible he just sat out there and still was mad at his father and mad at his son. It happens, right, in the community. But it also, it could very well that the son came into this party and just kind of sat down and just sat there and watched his dad dance, watching all this celebration and going, I don't deserve this. And never really receives the joy of sonship. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you're having trouble, your pastor said it, you're having trouble forgiving yourself. You don't think you deserve what God has to offer. Oh, baby, just open up and receive all of God's love. You know why? I, the reason why, if you're, if you're the, I, I, sorry, I, I, got some, I got some bad news, a little bad news for you. If you're one of those guys who are trouble, have trouble forgiving yourself, you don't think you deserve to receive God's love, that's pride. It's just pride. Because to receive all of what God has done, you have to say, you know what? I don't deserve one bit of it. Lord, just pour in. I, I receive your love, Lord God. I receive everything you have for me. Thank you, Jesus. It's all you. It's none of me. And then we can start celebrating and rejoicing because look what happens in this chapter. In this chapter, at the end of every parable, what happens? 
rejoicing that the, the sheep is found, rejoicing that the coin is found, rejoicing that the son has returned. The, he, the kingdom of heaven loves to rejoice. I love to rejoice when I see souls getting saved. I love to rejoice when I'm praying with someone. Carol and I, we, we're praying for this one girl who, who's like, Excuse me, she's demon possessed. She's puking in the bucket. For 45 minutes, she's just puking out all the garbage. And then she's whole at the end. And she's thanking us and we're going, we didn't do anything. God did it all. You know, coming to Indonesia, we've been there now 14 years. We love it, we, it's home for us. But let me tell you, it wasn't easy. It's not easy now. But I, I, I'd do it again in one second without even thinking just to see people coming to Jesus, just to see people who have never known God before. You know, we got people coming in our, in our gatherings, and they'll tell you that they've never been to church before. They don't even know what it is. Like Steve, my, 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 one of my campus pastors was just telling me, he was like, Donald, he goes, everybody was just crying. They, they don't know why. They say we come. We don't know why we come into the God's presence because they don't even know it's God's presence. They go, we come. And then during the worship, we're just crying and crying. Why? They keep saying, why? We say, you'll find out. Just keep seeking, because you'll find him. So I'm going to close, and I just, if you're lost, I want to I say a prayer for you. If you feel lost, just know the Father is looking for you, man. He's so hungry for you. There's no mountain he won't climb up. You know, he'll do whatever it takes. You have a you know, if you have a son or a daughter or a friend who's lost, just know Jesus is searching for him. But would you do me a favor? Join with Jesus. Stop staying away from people who don't know Jesus as if they're going to do something to you. Find a way to go to them and do something for them. Show them the love of God. Be the heart of the Father who searches and searches until he finds. Doesn't care if he gets dirty. Doesn't care. I'm going to pray those two prayers. Would you pray with me? First, Lord God, I pray for everyone here who has a son or a daughter or a friend or a next-door neighbor. Father, I pray you would break the hearts of everyone here, that, Lord God, we would get the heart of the Father to restore people who are lost. Father, we would stop thinking about ourselves, and, Lord God, we would begin to be used as instruments to bring about glory in other people's lives. And Father, I pray for anyone here who's lost. Lord, all they have to do, Lord, I pray they would just turn and start walking toward you. Father, I pray that they would hear your voice as they're lost. They would hear the shepherd's voice calling their name. And Lord, like a sheep, they would just cry out to be found. Father, I pray today, Lord God, if there's anyone here lost, that they would open up their heart and receive you as their Lord and Savior. And they would know that you forgive them of all their sins. In Jesus' name, amen.